2008 marked the 60th anniversary of modern day Israel. But as you and I know, Israel is much older than that with its real beginning almost 4,000 years ago. And that really is one of the great miracles of our day. When we look back through history, we see some of the great nations that have existed for a time, but then they were destroyed by other great nations. And we see that no other nation that has ever existed in this world has been wiped out and come back to life after being dead for 2,000 years, as the tiny nation of Israel has done. And so this is an ongoing miracle. It's happening in the Middle East, and we cannot take it for granted. It's just too spectacular to miss. Now, if anyone wants to know why is Israel different, we find the answer in the scriptures. God simply has a larger purpose for Israel than for any other nation that has ever existed. And so Israel's rebirth is no mistake. It's no quirk of nature or history. Israel's existence today comes at the very hand of God. He brought them back because he made a promise, and that promise is being fulfilled before our very eyes. The world sees it happening, but for the most part, it doesn't understand why it's happening, but someday they will. Soon the Abrahamic promise will be as well known as any document ever written by man, better known and greater than the Declaration of Independence, greater than the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and what makes this promise so important and so widespread is the fact that it's backed up by the power and the authority of Jehovah God himself. And that fact is going to cause it to change the eternal destiny of mankind. Now, if I was to ask you to recite the Abrahamic promise, I'm sure most of you can. It's repeated a number of times in the scriptures. Let's read one occurrence found in Genesis 22, 17 and 18. God says, in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. That singular promise is why Israel exists today. Israel is being prepared to begin the greatest social project ever undertaken. It's being prepared to bring God's law in order to a chaotic and dying world. Israel is being prepared to teach the world about the meaning of life, that without God, as a vital part of life, mankind cannot and in fact should not even exist. But getting to that point of eternal life for man, we know is going to be a painful and difficult process. And speaking of his second advent, Jesus described it like this. He said, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your deliverance is drawing near. Well, we know that the first and second advents have very different purposes. In his first advent, we know that Jesus was to provide the ransom sacrifice so that the Adamic curse could be lifted from the shoulders of mankind. But the purpose of the second advent is very different. It's to bring restitution and blessings under the Abrahamic promise. But Jesus described his return as a very fearful and troublous time. And of course, the reason is because at the Lord's second advent, we would see the amazing transition from the kingdoms of this world to the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is in the process of taking over this world. And we know currently the world belongs to Satan, that he's the God of this world, and he will not give it away easily. But then Jesus also told us to lift up our heads because these fearful times would also be the time of the church's deliverance. I love that. That's a precious assurance to the saints who are living in very difficult times. As difficult and turbulent as these times may be, we should take courage because the trouble is also an indication that the church will be delivered and enter the glories of the Lord. I said that the Abrahamic promise is nearing fulfillment, but in reality the Lord has been preparing the heavenly seed for over 2,000 years now, and so when he tells us to lift up our heads, it's not only for our blessing, but because in connection with the Abrahamic promise, 
This time we'll see the blessings of all mankind through the seed of Abraham. In verse 29, Jesus continues. He says, it says, Then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Brethren, that is what we are seeing before our very eyes. Remember back in our studies in Daniel, in, in Daniel the fourth chapter, that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was described as a mighty and powerful tree. And so generally in the scriptures, trees represent nations. When Jesus said, behold the fig tree and all the trees, he was telling us that there would be a proliferation of nations during the second advent. And that's just what we've seen. We know that the number of nations in the world has more than doubled since World War II. What once were colonies subjected to the whims of their dominating countries have now become independent nations under their own rule and government. But of course, the most significant birth has been that of the nation of Israel. As Jesus described, Israel has put forth leaves as the fig tree in the parable. And because of that, we know that the kingdom is near. Jesus even assured us that the generation living during the rebirth of Israel would see the kingdom established. My goodness, what a significant promise that is. We can't be certain of the year or the month, but we know that the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will also see the kingdom. And that's got to be in our generation. The prophetic time indicator for the rebirth of Israel is found in Zechariah 9.12. It says, Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Let me just quote a very concise explanation of this book from, of this verse from the booklet, This Land is Mine. It says, the word translated double in this text has the meaning of doubling, as of a sheet of paper folded in half. In other words, it is descriptive of a duplicate or like amount. The suggestion is that Israel would have a period of chastisement equal in length to her period of favor. But where does this favor, period of favor begin? What is the focal point of its fold in the middle from which we can date the period of disfavor? Beginning of favor of, the beginning of the period is uh, easy to trace. We find the first time the 12 tribes of Israel are described as a nation is at the death of Jacob in B.C. 1812, as recorded in Genesis 49:28. It is from this point that, we are that they are considered a nation and not just an extended family. To the Christian mind, it is just as easy to date the turning point as being that marked in the Zechariah reference. Just three verses earlier in Zechariah 9.9, 9, the day in which he declared that he would render double unto them was the very day in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem on an ass. This was four days before his death in the year A.D. 33. It was on that very day that he uttered the prophetic words of the desolation of Jerusalem. This, we believe, is the turning point between Israel's favor and disfavor from God. The period from B.C. 1812 to the year A.D. 33 is 1845 years. An equal portion from that point would point forward to the year A.D. 1878, a most significant date. It was in 1878 at the ending of the Turco-Russian War that the Berlin Congress of Nations opened the land of Palestine to Jewish colonization for the first time since the Diaspora. It was in 1878 that the first Jewish colony, Petitikva, a name aptly meaning Gate of Hope, was established by Jewish refugees from Russia. It was in 1878, according to David Ben-Gurion, that the first Aliyah, or wave of immigration, can be dated. And so we see, brethren, right on time, according to God's plan, the preparations for Israel to become a nation began. And in that book, there's another fascinating application of the double. This is what it says. But this double can be looked at from a still different standpoint. A Jewish scholar might well say that the diaspora did not really fully begin 
until the armies of Titus began to amass against Israel and drive them out of their homeland in the year A.D. 68. If we take this date, A.D. 68, as the turning point of this double, the period of favor stretches out to 1880 years. An equal period of 1880 years going forward from the year A.D. 68 brings one to the spectacular date of A.D. 1948, the very year in which the state of Israel became a reality. Look at the events of this past century. In 1878, we have three events previously noted, the Berlin Congress of Nations, the establishment of the first Jewish colony at Petitikva, and the onset of the first wave of immigration. In 1896, Theodor Herzl of Vienna called the first Zionist Congress to issue a call to Jewry everywhere to return to their ancestral homeland. In 1917, the government of Great Britain, due to the intervention of the Jewish chemist, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, issued the Balfour Declaration, placing His Majesty's Government of England on record as favoring the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. In 1948, following the passage of a United Nations resolution, the State of Israel was formally proclaimed. Thus, in steady, progressive steps, Israel has slowly regained her place among the nations which was promised to her by God. Brethren, let's not take this for granted. It's an amazing fulfillment of prophecy we see today. Jesus described these events as a fig tree sprouting leaves. It's a tree that's coming back to life. And so we see this as rock-solid prophecy. There can be no denying that the Lord's hand has made the events possible that have transpired with Israel, and all for a purpose. Well, you know, I say there's no denying the fact that God has a purpose in bringing Israel back, but in reality, many do deny it. You may have heard the phrase replacement theology. Here is how it's defined. Replacement theology essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel, that the many promises made to Israel in the Bible are fulfilled in the Christian church, not in Israel. So the prophecies in Scripture concerning the blessing and restoration of Israel to the promised land are spiritualized or allegorized into promises of God's blessings for the church. And so here's our dilemma. How do we answer replacement theology? Now, if this understanding is correct, then all the prophecies of Israel's restoration to their land are meaningless. Why restore natural Israel before the kingdom is fully established if they're no different than the rest of the world? Who are the princes of the earth that the Bible speaks about if they're not the ancient worthies who will have a special role in leading Israel to bring God's message to the world of mankind? Bringing Israel into their land is a very special reason and really is one of the great proofs of an earthly resurrection. If there was no earthly resurrection, then why do all this in the land of Israel? Why bring Israel back as a nation? If God is going to destroy the earth, it really would make no sense at all. Though we can understand why many Christians believe in replacement theology, let me state it very clearly that replacement theology is wrong. We have the Apostle Paul's words to assure us that God has not cast off his people. You remember the text in Romans, the 11th chapter, verses 25 through 28, the Apostle Paul writes, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn ungodliness away from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Well, these verses, in fact, the entire 11th chapter of Romans, shows us the relationship between the Christian church and natural Israel. Paul tells us that Israel will remain in their partially blind condition until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now that opens up a couple of questions for us, of course. How is Israel partially blind 
and what is the fullness of the Gentiles? The first answer, I think, is pretty easy. One of the reasons of their double of punishment was because they were unable to accept Jesus as their Messiah. The Apostle John says this very thing in John 1.11, says that he, Jesus, came unto his own, and his own received him not. Though Israel has become a nation again in preparation for the work of the earthly kingdom, they are still blind to the greatest truth ever presented to them, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he is the Savior of the world, and that he is Israel's Messiah as well. Though Israel was given God's law, and through the law understood many of the principles of God's justice, they are still blinded to the most important reason the law was given to them, to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah. In Galatians, Paul said that the law itself was supposed to be a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. And so their partial blindness continues, as Paul said, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When we look at the context of Romans 11, the meaning of that phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles, will become very clear. And so let's do that. Let's take a step back and look into some of the details of Romans, the 11th chapter. The chapter begins with a very strong and positive statement. Paul begins by asking a rhetorical question. He says, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What he not what the scriptures saith of Elijah? How he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now, from Paul's words here, we see very clearly that Israel was not cast off. But even as in Elijah's day, there was a remnant who had not bowed their knee to Baal. But you look at that and you say, well, can, can that be used as proof that God will use Israel to bring blessings to mankind and the kingdom? And when you look at that in context, you see, well, that's really not what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about the future kingdom. He's talking about the first advent at this point. And maybe that's why there's been some confusion about what the real role of natural Israel is. You know, the New Testament writers were still trying to work amongst the Jews. Paul was still hoping to convert many Jews as possible to Christianity. Starting at verse 5, Paul says that those 7,000 men of Elijah's day who were faithful believers in God represented a remnant of Jews at the first advent who became followers of Christ. Let's read that point in verses 5 through 7. He says, Even so then, at the present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, in these verses, Paul is talking about two groups. He's referring to the nation as a whole who were blinded and lost out on the opportunity to share in the high calling of the church. And he's also talking about the small number of Jews who were not blinded and who came into Christ. He calls them the remnant or, or the election. These were the few Jews who had the wisdom to accept Jesus as their Savior. They understood that salvation could not come through the law. They saw that their standing before God could come only through grace and through the blood of Christ. Now to a Jewish mind, it was, very, it was a very ingrained concept that their standing with God was possible because they lived by the Mosaic law. This was the heart of Judaism. But it became a stumbling block to them as a nation because they thought their justification to God was through the law. And so it became an obvious snare, because if you don't see the need for an atoning blood for your sins, then why would you see the need for a dying Savior? There was no need for it. You know, even the disciples didn't see that essential point until Jesus finally explained it to them after his resurrection. 
Now, up to this point, Paul is talking about the blindness of the nation as a whole and the remnant of Jews who came into Christ. Now, if we stop there, then we can see that that's the end of Israel. A remnant was taken, they became Christian, while the rest were cast off. But you know, Paul doesn't stop there. In talking about the blinded nation of Israel, he says in verses 11 and 12, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now look closely at those verses. Paul seems to be contradicting himself. In verse 11 he says, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. In other words, no, they didn't stumble that they should fall. But then in verse 12 he says, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world. In other words, yes, they did fall. And so he asks, what's the point that Paul is making here? Is it a contradiction? And the answer is simple. You just read it from a better translation and it becomes clear. The, contra the seeming contradiction is cleared up. So we're going to read these two verses again from the New American Standard. It says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now if their transgression be riches for the world, and their future be their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Paul is saying that Israel didn't fall. Israel stumbled. Israel transgressed. And their transgression was responsible for crucifying Jesus, which in turn provided the ransom sacrifice. And the ransom will someday mean the riches of eternal life for the world of mankind. Paul then adds that their failure as a nation also opened up a way for Gentiles to enter the path to spiritual riches through the high calling of the Christian church. It's an amazing insight into the divine plan of the ages that God allowed the transgression of Israel to bring salvation and also to open up the way for Gentiles to become members of the body of Christ. I love Paul's statement in verse 12 when he says, Now if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? And so we ask, what is Israel's fulfillment? Well, Israel's fulfillment, Israel's destiny, Israel's place in God's plan is to be the earthly seed of blessing as the sand which is upon the seashore mentioned to Abraham. If we deny Israel that role, then we are denying God's promise to Abraham. If Israel doesn't have a special place in God's plan, then neither does Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or any other faithful member mentioned in Hebrews the 11th chapter. Paul expands on this thought in verse 15. For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now if Israel were cast off permanently and were no different than the rest of, the, of mankind, why would Paul be making this point that Israel's restitution would mean life from the dead. The only answer is that their rebirth as a nation will be a key factor in bringing the blessings of the Abrahamic promise to the world of mankind. Pointing them out was like a signpost telling us that when you see Israel reborn, you will know that the kingdom is not far off. It completely supports the point that Jesus made about the fig tree. On reprint 2196, we read this comment. It says, the blessing of Israel under the new covenant means not only an opportunity of life from the dead to them, but also a similar blessing of opportunity for all the families of the earth. Now, Paul is not done with his line upon line reasoning. He continues to buttress this point about Israel's special role. In verse 16, he says, For if the first piece of dough be holy, the lump is also and if the root be holy, the branches are too. Now what he's saying here is that if God considers Israel holy, like that first piece of dough, 
Then he also considers all of mankind holy, pictured in that larger lump of dough. But notice that Israel is considered by God as that first piece taken out of mankind, distinct from the larger lump. Israel will be the first to receive the blessings promised because they are that little piece of dough pictured here, separated from mankind, in order to do a special work in God's plan. Paul then goes on to give us a deeper picture than this lump of dough, using the imagery of an olive tree. He says, if the root be holy, the branches are too. Paul has now drawn for us two pictures, a lump of dough with that first piece taken out of it, and an olive tree with the holy root, which brings forth holy branches. The root of this olive tree pictures the source of the nation of Israel. It's Father Abraham and the promise that God made to him to bless all the families of the earth through his seed, through his progeny. In verse 17 he says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in amongst them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, and you stand only by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Behold the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more shall these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. What a wonderful picture that Paul draws for us here. God gave Abraham a promise that flourished in his heart. And that promise was to nourish the descendants of Abraham. Those who believed it were inspired by it. They were strengthened by it. And they were prepared for the great work that lay ahead of them. But as a whole, the natural branches were cut off from the heavenly portion of the Abrahamic promise, the stars of heaven when they rejected Jesus as the one who could make the Abrahamic promise a reality. But this cutting off was strictly a temporary condition. In fact, Paul tells us that they will be grafted in again. He said it in verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. It is a fact that Paul makes later that Israel will not continue in their unbelief. That's stated in verse 26 when it says, and thus all Israel shall be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I will take away their sins. There's the regrafting of Israel back into the Abrahamic promise once their unbelief is removed. That is a criteria that God established in verse 23. Once the ancient worthies, the old faithful members, are brought back from the grave, their first work will commence with Israel. They will teach Israel about their sins and point to them their true Messiah, that it was Jesus who they crucified some 2,000 years earlier. It's going to be a painful message for Israel to receive. In Zechariah 12.10, we read about how they're going to react to that message. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. Here is the scene of Israel's conversion in the removal of their partial blindness. This will lead to their regrafting into the olive tree when that spirit of grace and supplication is poured upon them. So here we see them again partaking of the root of the olive tree, 
as they receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting allusion to Jesus in these verses, and it's not obvious in our English translation. When that text says um, that they will look upon me whom they have pierced, the word me consists of the Hebrew letters Aleph and Tau. Aleph and Tau are the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. What does that remind you of? Remember, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. Now, Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And so here in Zechariah, we're told that Israel will finally come to recognize the Alpha and Omega, or the Aleph and the Tau, as the one that they had pierced. As the title Alpha and Omega suggests, we know that Jesus was the first and last direct creation of God. But you know, it means much more than that. It also shows that Jesus is the central figure of the divine plan. He was at the beginning of the plan, he was the Alpha, and he will be at the end of the plan, at the completion of God's plan, the Omega. He will cause the fulfillment of all that God has promised. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau. Once the ancient worthies are brought back to life, Israel's response to their teachings will be thoroughly appropriate. Zechariah says that they will mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and they will be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. Mourning is appropriate when there's something to be mourned, and Israel certainly will have that. They will mourn for their national sins, they will repent of all the wrong that they did as a nation. They will acknowledge their mistake in crucifying the Lord of glory. They will thoroughly humble themselves and experience the acceptance mentioned in Psalm 51 when it says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. What a glorious day that will be when the nation of Israel returns to take its rightful place as the earthly seed of promise. Paul tells us back in Romans 11 that they are beloved for the Father's sakes. And then he adds, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Now, Paul could not have stated it any stronger that his promise to the fathers of Israel is irrevocable. Even God himself cannot revoke that promise that he made to Abraham to use him and his seed to bless all the families of the earth. But there's also an important lesson that Paul draws for us Gentiles. And truly really one of the main points that Paul wants us to understand. He said that the Christian's source of strength comes from the root of the olive tree. And so the question is, how do you put that into practical terms? How do we partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree? The root is the Abrahamic promise. And so the question is, how do we partake of the Abrahamic promise? In Galatians 3.29, Paul says, If you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we partake of the root by coming into Christ, by dedicating our lives to him, and serving him by claiming the promises that we will share in the work of blessing all the families of the earth as the heavenly part of the Abrahamic promise, the stars of the heavens. When you think of that, you realize that it's an awesome privilege that the church is called to, that we can have an effect on all the people who have ever lived on this earth. When we look at what is being offered to us as a heavenly seed, there's one very important quality that I believe must be part of our personal makeup. Because of the very nature of the promise, it is essential that each of us be driven by a desire to serve others. Can you imagine God allowing anyone to be part of the seed of promise who didn't thrive on serving others? It was really one of the great themes of Jesus' ministry, wasn't it? And Paul agreed with it wholeheartedly when he said, through love, serve one another. Can you imagine God choosing selfish, self-centered people to be part of the seed of blessing? This promise made to Abraham 
must be at the very foundation of why we want to dedicate our lives to him. Without a doubt, the heavenly seed will be comprised of only those willing to give of themselves, willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of others. Brethren, the heavenly seed is truly a class of heroes. Just as much as the heroes of old mentioned in Hebrews 11, it will be a selfless group devoted to the service of God and the blessing of mankind. If we don't desire to help fulfill the promise of bringing God back to the hearts of man with every fiber of our being, then we've accepted the wrong calling. When Paul said that we partake of the root of the olive tree, he meant it to be our lifeblood, our reason for existing. This is not a passive, half-hearted course we've taken. There is nothing that could be more important that we could be involved in than the preparation of the heavenly seed. So brethren, never take your calling lightly. Don't let the truth and your understanding of the scriptures just be your doctrinal position. Let it be your passion. Let it be your vision. Let it be your great desire in life. Paul also said that we partake of the fatness of the olive tree. Just like a natural tree gets its nourishment from the roots, so our spiritual nourishment comes through the promise. The fatness is the nourishing elements of the olive tree, and it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so besides having a servant mentality, we must also be deeply affected by the Lord's Spirit. The Lord's Spirit should cause great changes in each and every one of us. You know, a tree that's not growing is either dying or it's dead. But sometimes our, our natural dispositions are so ingrained in us that we might think it's impossible for us to change. Even the Lord's Spirit can't change me. <laughs> Have you ever said, you know, that's just the way I am, it's my nature, and I can't change it? Or have you ever thought, you know, I tend to lose my temper easily, but my father was like that, and so it's genetic, and so there's really nothing I can do about it. Or have you ever thought that uh, I just don't have patience? Um, there's nothing I can do about it, it's just the way I am. Or, or have you ever felt, uh, you know, when people do me wrong, I, I can't forgive them. Uh, it's just part of me that I remember the wrongs that are done to me. Or have you ever felt, uh, I think about this one a lot, you know, I'm just naturally lazy. <laughs> so let other people do the work. This is my nature and there's not much I can do about it. Well, brethren, when we partake of the fatness of the olive tree, our natural dispositions are affected by the principles of truth and mercy and love and devotion and faithfulness and gentleness and patience and all the wonderful fruits that can come when we let the Holy Spirit affect our hearts. We cannot successfully end this earthly pil pilgrimage without major character changes. So brethren, in one way, don't be satisfied with who you are. What we are being invited to is too great to give anything but our best effort. To be part of the seed of promise will be an unimaginable privilege. To bring the light of truth to a dark world, to bring a knowledge of God to a world that has misunderstood him and accredited evil to him, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to strengthen and encourage all sorts of people from every walk of life. These are the greatest works that we can ever share in. We often quote Romans 12, 1 and 2 as a consecration verse. But did you ever notice that verse 1 begins with the word therefore? Therefore is always a concluding thought that ties into a previous line of reasoning. After his discussion of the lump of dough being holy, the root and the branches of the olive tree being holy, which will result in great riches for Jews and Gentiles alike, he says at the end of Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Therefore... I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul urges us to present our bodies as living sacrifices because of everything that he has spoken about in chapter 11. We should give ourselves in full consecration because of God's promise to bless all the families of the earth through us as the heavenly seed. And Paul says it is a most reasonable thing to be asked of us. When we live a deeply consecrated life and begin to take on the characteristics of Christ, we are partaking of the root and fatness of the olive tree, and we're becoming vital and useful members of the heavenly seed. And so after examining the context of Romans 11, it's clear what Paul meant by the phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles. He's been talking about the Gentiles being grafted into the olive tree, the natural and natural Israel being cut off. In verse 25, we see the same two classes. We see natural Israel and we see the Christian Gentiles. Remember back in verse 12, Paul had discussed the fulfillment or fullness of Israel. He said, now if the fall of them be your riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? We saw that the fullness of Israel will be their establishment as the earthly seed of blessing. And so likewise, the fullness of the Gentiles must refer to the same thing, but for the church, its completion and establishment as a heavenly seed through, the, through which the blessings of the Abrahamic promise come. It's no accident that the two words, fullness, is the same Greek word in both verses. Paul is making the direct comparison between the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel. When the full number of the heavenly seed is complete, then the merit of the ransom can be released and the ancient worthies brought back to life. They in turn will remove the blindness of Israel and Israel will become the earthly avenue through which the blessings of the kingdom will come then will be fulfilled that wonderful prophecy in Zechariah the 8th chapter. It says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth, and in righteousness. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear ye not. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall they take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So brethren, as we watch Israel and what's happening in the Middle East, we can feel the nearness of the earthly kingdom. Yes, there's troubles and problems persist everywhere, but these in reality are, are birth pangs for a new baby to be born. Everything we see around us today should be a stimulus to us to set ourselves on fire, to realize that life is not going to go on this way for very long. Be encouraged by that and remember Jesus' words when he said that when you see these things, look up for your deliverance draweth near. And not just your deliverance, but the deliverance of all the world of mankind. Paul said, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. 
Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Isaiah wrote, When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And he says again, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. And the revelator says, And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away.